Hey everyone, it's Stephen here. Today I'm going to be looking at a commercial investment property that I bought a couple of months ago now. This is my first visit to it since I bought it and I thought it would be a good excuse to show you around. I'm going to cover what the opportunity was, the pros and cons of it, my key lessons from my due diligence and the best thing of all which is the numbers on it so you'll understand how much I put in and how much I got out. If you've watched my other videos, you'll also know that I like to buy commercial investment properties with also some kind of development angle on them. And this one's no different to those. So have a look as you go through the video and see if you can guess what that development angle is. made of brick with steel frame construction it's got a flat roof it's got a basement underneath and it's 7181 square feet in size over the last three years it's been fully refurbished so it's had everything done to it. it's had a new roof it's had new AC new heating new electrical wiring diverse fiber paths they've got their own kind of mini IT center in there as it's a call center so at the back here you can see there's parking for about 25 cars, it goes all the way around the back there. So let's have a look now at the pros and cons of this commercial investment property as I saw it at the time. And this is going to give you a good idea about what I look for and what I don't look for in a property. So one of the first things I look at is always what's the return? What's the actual return of that property based on the actual asking price? So with this particular property, they were already advertising on the sales brochure that it was a net initial yield of 9.15%, which is pretty good straight out of the bat before any negotiations or anything like that. And even better was that it had an eight year lease that was pretty new. It had only been agreed in March, 2021. And this may be kind of obvious, but you wanna get long leases when you're looking at commercial investment properties because the longer the lease, the longer you don't have to worry about finding a tenant, the longer that the tenant, if you're getting the right lease, is responsible for all maintenance and repairs. That's if you get a full repairing and insuring lease, which this particular lease was. That's another thing I look for when I'm looking at leases. Is it an FRI lease, which means it's full repairing and insuring, which means the tenant's on a hook for everything. With this particular one, it had a schedule of condition associated with that full repairing and insuring lease, which is kind of normal for buildings that are, you know, of a certain age. It's not brand new. Therefore, what the tenant's obligations are is that they have to keep it to that standard that it was when they went in. If it isn't, you can then claim dilapidations, which is a whole nother video on its own, um, which essentially means that they'll pay you whatever the money is to fix up the property back to the condition it was before they went into the property. There was also just a single tenant in this property, which is great, it's 7,181 square feet, single tenant, eight year lease, and the tenant was a big company. It wasn't just like a, a small mum and dad kind of business, a small business that had only been established a few years ago. There's a big story around the actual seller and then the eventual tenant of who it is, which to cut it short is, the guy built up a business and then he sold it to this bigger multinational company and it's the multinational company that's the actual tenant for this property, which I'm going to cover more in the due diligence section coming up in a minute to get you some idea about types of due diligence that you should look at when you're looking at commercial investment property or any particular investment property really. 
You'll find in some sales brochures, depending on how good the agent is and how good the tenant is, you get all the numbers about that particular company. So they tell you exactly how much money they made in the previous financial year. In this particular instance, they generated 177 million in sales revenue and they've got net assets of around 70 million. So it's a good sized company. They're the type of tenants you at least wanna have because they should be able to afford your small rental income of say 87 grand a year if this is the case. And they have lots of locations around the UK. They're also based in the US and other countries globally. So the property has got a flat roof, which generally is a bit of a negative, but with this particular one, it'd been a brand new roof put on there in the last couple of years and it's got a 25 year guarantee. So it kind of mitigates the risk that you've got with that particular aspect that's a flat roof for a long time going into the future. And I also saw the flat roof as a potential development angle because it's flat. You can potentially do something with that, which I'll talk a bit further later on in this video about the development angles that I see for this particular property. As I alluded to earlier in the video when I was on site, this property had been fully refurbished. They'd spent over 500,000 pounds on it. I'd able to see the accounts. I saw the figures of how much they'd spent on what. This all came out as part of the capital allowances I'm looking at when I was looking again through the due diligence part of this process. And so I could see that they've invested a lot of money into this particular property itself on top of what they bought it for and everything was, you know, it's all been done in the last two to three years. So into the cons then, I've got three cons that I'd like to highlight to you because these things might come up when you're looking at property, even if it's commercial or any type of property. The first one is knotweed. What they have to do when you're selling a property is you have to declare that there's knotweed at your property has to come out, otherwise you can get all sorts of uh, things coming against you if you don't declare that and then it's subsequently found after you've bought a property and people knowingly had something there. And in this case, they knew it because it had been treated by the previous owner when this person bought it, so he knew that it had been done. It's because it's commercial, not weed, I'm not that fussed about. It is potentially for development purposes going forward, but I just thought if there's a way to treat it, we'll get it treated, get it killed. It had already been treated once um, but it's starting to grow back. So what I agreed was that there's a way to get a treatment plan, five year treatment plan. Looked into just dig digging it out, but I spoke to the professionals, they said, don't necessarily want to do that because you can disturb it and it can reinvigorate it. I agreed with the seller that we would deduct that amount from the purchase price. So in the end, the seller paid for the knotweed five-year treatment plan, which amounted to around 3,800 pounds. Either way, I'm not paying for it. It's going to get treated and hopefully will be resolved within that five years. So another big thing, and this is something that can come up quite a lot, especially in England, <laughs> is that you've got access issues. So with this property, there was no access to it from the front, as in on the title, there was no formal access to it. But in reality, it's got a massive driveway to it with drop curb and everything like that. It'd been in use since the day it was built. With something that's been in use for a certain amount of time, you kind of by default get a right of way over it. But what the solicitor did was um, in consultation with me and with the seller, it was a big discussion point at one step point, and we just got statutory declarations done from that. So the previous owner had already done one to this particular seller who I was buying it from. And the seller then also did a statutory declaration since they bought it whenever the year was for that. I think it was 2014. That has no issues as well with it. So I've got those two statutory declarations which totaled around 40 years in total that they've been using that with no, no one saying that you can't go over it or anything like that. So by default, you kind of got right of way access over it, it seems. Either way, I took additional insurance out from it as well as part of what you can do when you're buying a property. There is a risk there, but I've mitigated it based on the amount that I paid for the property. Also, I've got the statutory declaration, so I don't see it as a, as a big enough risk that it wasn't worth the reward with buying the property. So with leases, there's normally a break clause and this particular break clause date was three years into the lease of an eight year one. So it wasn't in the middle. To mitigate that, I did a couple of tenant interviews which proved that they were looking to stay there long term. So all you can do is make a judgment call that they're gonna likely break. If not, 
there's nine months notice on the break date, which is a good amount of time to go and try and advertise and try and find someone else. Or I could potentially go the development route and develop the, the building and the, the, the plot. What I did to mitigate this risk even further was the day before we're due to exchange, I contacted the tenant again just to double check what his intentions were with the property, what's his thoughts on it. And he said, no, we're happy with it. We've got no intention to break. If this allays any more fears for you, we've just invested a load of new IT kit into that particular property. For me, I was kind of thinking that I'm happy with that risk. It's I've mitigated it as much as I could do, I'll just accept it. So when it comes to due diligence, this is important no matter what you're buying, whether it's a commercial property or residential property, you always need to do some due diligence. Even if you think you've done enough due diligence, you probably haven't. There's always more due diligence that you can potentially do, especially when it comes to commercial. One of the key things that I always do with a commercial investment property is I conduct tenant interviews. Why we wanna do tenant interviews is to double check what type of tenant they are. So are they happy with the property? Is there any issues with the property? If they had some money, what would they change about the property? There's a whole, there's about 45 to 50 questions I ask them, takes about half an hour to even an hour, depending on how we chat. I'm trying to get whether they're happy there, is the property performing enough for their business, how well's their business doing as well. So you wanna be checking this stuff because if you're just going in assuming everything's good, they've got this eight year lease, they're gonna pay it, no worries, but they're potentially going bankrupt. <laughs> You wanna find that out before you buy that property. And you kind of tease that out with some of the questions that you would ask as part of this tenant interview. I conducted two interviews because the first one he'd lined up with the seller being that he was the tenant. But as I went through the tenant interview questions, I realized he wasn't actually the tenant and he's the seller and he's trying to want me to buy it. Um, but it was good because I asked him no end of stuff because I realized he's the seller and got him to fix up a few things out of that. And then I went back to the agent and said, no, this guy isn't the right tenant. He's not the tenant ultimately responsible for paying the bill, the invoices each quarter. I wanna to talk to that person. They then gave me the managing director of the group that bought this property and I did a online call with him. He was great, really helpful. Asked him all the questions again. Everything seemed fine with that. Key one about the break clause was that no, we don't intend to change. They're acquiring businesses. And this business was one that they'd acquired back when they signed their lease in 2021, just before that, obviously. Tenant interviews passed based on the information that they gave me. So it gave me a good feeling to progress with the sale. Other concerns was because I was seeing that this property had been bought out, it was like, well, how valid is the lease? How valid is the valuation of this property? And because all of this could have been uplifted. I looked into that and worked with the agent and he did give me a lot more information about who valued it and how did they arrive at the, the rental income? How much should it be worth? Is it just overinflated at 87 grand a year? Should it be actually 47 grand a year? So what the agent did is he gave me comparables on the rental income so he could show me similar sized properties and what the rent that had just been agreed for those particular ones. And they were in the same ballpark as this one, if not even more expensive than this one. But I was happy with that, that passed. I was happy with the valuation that had been independently verified. I was happy with the rent that that had been independently done. So one thing that I always think about is capital allowances when I'm buying commercial property, whether it's an investment or any type of property, if, especially if someone's done a lot of work in it recently, there's some capital allowances to be got there. And why you want capital allowances is because that amount of money can be deducted from any tax that you owe from your rental income. I wanted whatever capital allowances was left at the point that we were to buy it to be transferred across. So I've got that agreed in the contract, but when we got into it a little more, they knew that they were gonna be selling it and they'd taken all the capital allowances literally out of this property bar two pounds. <laughs> there was some left for structures and buildings, which you can claim at 3%, and there was 180,000 pounds worth for structures and buildings. Also, this property was VAT registered. So that means the tenants paying VAT on top of the rent, and it also means when you're buying a property, you have to pay VAT on top of that particular purchase price that you agree. What you do to mitigate that so you don't pay any VAT is you transfer the property as a going concern, TOGC. I've done a video about this. Go and look at that video on my channel if you're interested in that type of thing. 
And that's what I did specifically for this one. And that video actually is all about what I did with this purchase to transfer to going concern. And I did that in a super fast time because I kind of forgot about it a bit and got it to the point where we we're exchanging and thought, oh, I'm not paying VAT. Looking at the contract from the solicitor, need to get that fixed up and a fast track that whole transfer of a going concern. So it proves that you can get that done quickly if you want to. So by doing that, I then didn't have to pay VAT on top of the purchase price. So let's get into the numbers now. This is the crucial bit that I love when I'm looking at these types of videos. So with this, they wanted 900,000 pounds. I eventually agreed on an agreed sale price of 855,000 pounds. So that's not bad already with an 87 grand income. I'm getting better than a 10% return, 87 grand, 855. So we've then got the legal fees of 3,800. We've got the stamp duty being 32,250. We also got some fees of two and a half grand that I had to pay there, which was the other solicitor's fees. On the other side, I had to pay for their solicitor as well, the, the lender's solicitor, which you'll find as common when you're buying commercial properties, all the fees basically you have to pay for as the, as the investor. And then I had valuation fees as well, which were £1,045. That's for the bank's valuation fee. And then I've got 2% fees for the lender added on to the loan, which was 11760 They'd recently gone up from 1.5% to 2%. So you might find that you can get anywhere between that when you're buying commercial investment property, but there's those fees there that you need to pay. So in this instance, the total cost of this property was costing me 906,355 pounds. And I've got a mortgage of just under 600,000 pounds. So that meant that the cash that I had to put down was 302,419 pounds. Not cheap as in how much cash you can put down, but I was pleased that I was getting an income of 87 grand a year, but I've got to pay a mortgage on out of that as well. So let's see what the numbers work out at as a net return. So the income was at 87 grand. This works out at per month, 7,250 pounds per month. The mortgage was costing me 3,683 pounds and 5p, which meant that the monthly cash flows 3,567 pounds a month. And my cash on cash return is 14.15%. So that's a great cash on cash return. And I'm all, I always look at what's the cash down and what's my cash back. That's the cash on cash return that we're looking at, where, which gives us our proper return. So if you guessed yet what the development angle is for this particular property, there's actually quite a few angles on this particular one. Anyone that's into commercial to residential would obviously be thinking probably around permitted development rights. What PD rights are available for this particular property? So with offices, they're class E, and with class E comes a class MA permitted development right, which means that you convert commercial into residential. And so you can do that PD right, which means the reason why you want permitted development rights is because it gives you the right to make these changes to the property within 56 days. You don't have to go through full planning, which can take however long. You've got no timeline there. Another angle is that I could also build another floors, another stories on top of this property. It's two stories high with a basement kitchen underneath. There's a permitted development right that gives you the right to build extra floors on top of detached properties, but they have to be three stories. So this isn't three stories because it doesn't include the basement. It has to include three stories above ground. Can't use that permitted development angle on this particular one. I'd have to go through full planning to build additional stories. But if it's fully tenanted, that's fine. Time isn't of the essence. You know, what's the highest and best value for this particular plot of land? And it might be to build two additional stories on it, convert it all to residential or Another angle is I could leave the bottom floor commercial, the upper floor residential, and build another two stories on top of it as more residential, even extend it at the back more. You know, there's enough cut, there's 25 parking spaces at the back. Could even develop the back into townhouses or another block of apartments along the back uh, fence line there in an L shape even, and still have all the parking, parking underneath it maybe, and then parking behind the back of this one. Multiple angles for this particular one, that's why I thought 
is pretty good and I'm buying it at low price per square foot, 126 pounds per square foot. So, and there's, a, there's lots of upside angles that I think with this plot, because it's so big that you could then develop. So I hope that may have inspired you to go and look at commercial investment property. It costs you a bit more money down. This one cost me 300 grand down, but the return is pretty good. Haven't got any aggravation with this one like you do with the residential property and residential tenants. The capital appreciation may not be as much as residential, but it depends what you're after. Risk versus reward always. Aggravation versus no aggravation. Where's the balance? So, you know, it's exciting. This is why I love property investing.